Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to the last session of the day um, at this wonderful conference on philosophy, disability, and social change. Today, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Lori Gruen, who is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, as well as Professor of Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Science and Society. Dr. Gruen also coordinates Wesleyan Animal Studies and is working on a number of projects, including an edited volume examining the damaging impact of carceral logics on the variety of non-human and human animals, a project on disabled animals, and a co-authored monograph with Dr. Alice Crary titled Animal Crisis. Dr. Gruen is the author or editor of 11 books, including Ethics and Animals, an introduction that will be coming out in a second edition next year. She also lives with three dogs, Taz and Zinni and Eli. I don't know if you can hear my own Boston Terrier is grunting a little bit in the background. It seemed a little appropriate. <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone that the conference reminds tomorrow, uh, that the conference continues tomorrow. And also that during the Q&A, uh, people can type their questions into the uh, chat button at the bottom. And I also want to remind everybody that if they would like the closed caption option, there is also a button at the bottom of the screen uh, for that. So without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Lori Gruen to present her paper on captivity, cross-world logics, and disposability. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm a white uh, looking person wearing purple colored glasses and a black shirt. And I have long gray and black hair. And I'm in a pretty bland looking room with a bird poster in the background. I'm really happy to be at this conference. And I really want to applaud Shelley and Joe for putting it on. I also want to say that I completely agree with Christine, who said yesterday that we need to look outside philosophy to do philosophy well. Henry Sidgwick also urged us um, to do the same thing, saying that we should not trust philosophers on topics of practical importance unless they have engaged with non-philosophers. And I really could not agree more. It's also really great to follow on Joe's talk um, and Melinda Hall's question at the end, as I want to further the conceptual analysis that, be, that he began and look more into this question of power and control. Um, my talk today um, will understand power as carceral capture and the institutions that I'm going to discuss definitely do not pass the burrito test. So um, I won't be able to cover everything I have to say on captivity, carceral logics, and disposability, each of which I've written quite a bit on. Um, and I'm going to try to keep my comments short. Um, but I do hope to convey the sense of the direction of the work that I'm doing, um, hoping to prompt some uh, added thoughts. And I'm looking forward to the rich discussion in the Q&A. For a while now, I've been thinking about the particular harms of captivity and finding that most of the resources of traditional theorizing, at least in ethical and political philosophy, don't quite capture all of what's wrong. I'm troubled by the captivity of both humans and non-human animals. And in this talk, I'll be mentioning cases of animal captivity and human captivity. I'm, I, I'm suddenly realizing, am I, I, is the screen on Lisa or is it on me? I'm just wondering if- um, I believe it's on you. Okay, you see me. Okay, that's yeah. great. Okay, sorry about that. Lisa, you might turn your video off and then there can't be oh. any, go and also uh, mute the microphone. I didn't tell you that before, that's fine. Okay, so I, I'm basically, um, just to say, I'm, I'm troubled um, by uh, 
captivity of both humans and non-human animals. And in this talk, I'll be mentioning cases of animal captivity as well as human captivity. But I want to note at the outset that I'm not making an analogy between the violence towards and disregard for human captives and the violence towards a disregard for animals. Um, there are vast differences. Being a black prisoner is not the same as being a black professor. Being a black professor is not the same as being a white professor. Being a disabled white woman is not the same as being a black man. And none of these are the same as being a chimpanzee or being a chimpanzee is not the same as being a chihuahua. Being a chihuahua is not the same as being a giraffe. A giraffe. And you get the point. Um, but too much of the time, these various differences, differences in race, differences in animality, differences in ability, um, differences in gender and gender expression get occluded when these comparisons are made or when theorists focus almost exclusively on similarities. Um, and I um, want to sort of make this caveat that this is not, um, it's something I'm aware of and I'm not doing. There's a long problematic history of these comparisons between animals and subordinated humans and the offensive comparisons between animals and cognitively and intellectually disabled humans do a tremendous disservice, to put it mildly, to both disabled people and disabled animals. There's much to say here about the dangers of what gets called the argument for marginal cases, but I'm not gonna talk about that today, although I'm happy to have a discussion about it. Um, we need to really challenge the argument for marginal cases um, as forcefully and often as possible. The language that authorizes the exclusion, institutionalization, and even extermination of humans often compares humans to other animals. And there's a lot to be said about these vexed comparisons. Um, political theorist Claire Jean Kim has done important work on this in her book, Dangerous Crossings. And today I wanna to draw attention to what I'm calling an underlying logic that can be usefully analyzed in various distinct cases, often in relation to one another. My thinking for this paper um, is motivated by a series of intellectual exclusions within otherwise really important work for social change. I, I'm hoping that you can see that uh, slide. Um, in her exciting new book uh, called Decarcerating Disability, Deinstitutionalization and Prison Abolition, Liet Ben Moshe recounts a conversation she had while she was in graduate school with Angela Davis. Um, she asked Davis if she knew of anyone who was working on the connection between disability and prison abolition because she hadn't found anyone who was making these connections. Um, and Davis basically encouraged Ben Moshe to do that work. So Decarcerating Disability and her earlier co-edited volume, Disability Incarcerated, bring prison abolition and disability justice into conversation. And these are wonderful connections between ableism and the criminal legal system. And in particular, Liet Ben Moshe brings to our attention the mistake that many make about thinking that our mass incarceration crisis is linked to the deinstitutionalization of asylums. But in fact, she argues this deinstitutionalization is a complex, often fraught, but actual instance of a type of abolition. So it's, it's really um, exciting. We think of abolition often as something that is aspirational, but what um, Ben Moshe does in this volume, which is very, very detailed, is to argue that actually we have an instance of abolition that's already happened in the deinstitutionalization process of state-run asylums. It's, so it's in tre tremendously important work, but one of the things that it doesn't do is address non-human animals or the human animal binary. Fortunately, Sonora Taylor's work in Beasts of Burden brings the movement for the liberation of animals into conversation with disability studies and disability activism in a way that boldly counters the tensions that are inherent in the standard extensionist or liberal humanist formulations in animal ethics. Uh, the new 
edited collection, disability and animality perspectives in critical animal studies deepens this crucial conversation. And my co-edited volume with Fiona probin Rapsi called Animalities is a contribution to MAD studies and feminist animal studies. But both of these important volumes and Sun Sunny Taylor's really important monograph um, don't address prisons and mass incarceration um, in any depth. So there's this gap um, that my thinking I've been trying uh, to fill. There was a conference uh, in 2019 in the fall um, in Banff uh, called Building Abolition that brought scholars and activists working in these three areas together. Um, and I'm really uh, optimistic, even though I'm mostly a pessimist, but I'm really optimistic about the ongoing conversations that bring the insights and commitments of prison abolition, disability justice, and critical animal studies together. And my, my hope is that today um, I will be able to make a small contribution to this crucial but still developing conversation. One way to reframe the seeming antagonisms between our simple or simple occlusions of these seemingly distinct areas of inquiry is to focus on what I call carceral logics. Um, I have a particular way of thinking about carceral logics. And so to get an understanding of how I think of it, um, I think it's helpful to first explore the various conditions of captivity, which unlike um, Joe's uh, discussion of institutionalized care have a slightly different, um, well, maybe even more than slightly, uh, have a fairly different uh, sort of set of phenomenological and experiential um, circumstances. So let me first just briefly say something about how I understand captivity. Um, humans and non-humans who are incarcerated, that is confined by bars, chains, cages, prison, coops, or locked doors for which they don't have a key, are denied very obvious freedoms. They are not free to make any choices at all. Now, none of us are free to do whatever we might want to, since we're restricted by state, economic, and social institutions and ideologies that limit us in a range of ways by the binary genders we're assigned, by social and psychic worlds structured by ableism, and by setting sometimes uncrossable boundaries based on class, religion, ethnicity, race, and even by our species. But being limited in what we want to do and who we want to be, which we always are, significantly differs from physical confinement. And not all physical confinement counts as captivity. Being physically confined, say to the vast territory like the earth or to a much smaller space, for example, a wheelchair, doesn't mean one is clearly or obviously a captive. Humans and other animals are physically limited by what our bodies can't do. We might say each of us is captive in our bodies that we have different abilities. And in some sense, that is also true, but it's a sense that can deflect the distinct challenges posed by human and non-human incarceration. In captivity, there's a particular type of dependency that occurs. Captives are both practically and existentially dependent on their captors to satisfy all their basic needs. And though dependency um, itself has had a very important uh, set of analyses within um, both disability and feminist ethics. Um, the idea here is a very specific kind of dependency that I want to highlight. Um, it's not that uh, captives are, it's not only that captives are dependent, which again, we all are in different ways, but in the case of the captives that I'm interested in thinking about, dependency is institutionalized, which renders the captives subjugated subjects. So another way of thinking about how I'm understanding captivity is that um, interdependence is not possible in these conditions of captivity. 
Incarcerated individuals do not have the opportunity to decide what to eat, when to sleep, where to go, who to spend time with or not spend time with. I, I really like this burrito test. They do not pass it, this situation. They are not passing the burrito test. Vocational, educational, and recreational opportunities are not um, are extremely limited if they exist at all. Relationships with loved ones are curtailed. In some cases, prisoners are shipped to federal facilities far from their families, often separating parents from their children for years. Almost all choices are restricted and activities are completely controlled. Many prisoners have become so dependent on the carceral system that if they are paroled, they can't survive outside. Not only are they prohibited from exercising their autonomy and agency as captives, but the very capacity to do so can be stripped through incarceration. Incarceration, in other words, is disabling. I'd like to read a bit of work from an incarcerated man uh, who I've been working with in a maximum security prison for 10 years through the prison education program at Wesleyan that uh, I've helped get off the ground. Um, a version of this paper was written in my advanced philosophy class and another version of it um, was recently published last year in the Yale Law Journal. And the slide that I'm gonna show has part of the quote, but I'm gonna read a little bit more. I really strongly encourage you um, to, to look um, at, um, at the, um, the article by James Davis III. Here's what um, James says. The prisoner's psyche is traumatized by the separation from his prior existence, even as he must contend with the new existence that has been imposed upon his old. He came to prison with double double consciousness, with double consciousness, referring here to Du Bois, and is forced by this new world to develop a new consciousness to reconcile his new reality. The imposition of this prisoner identity is effectuated through different means. He is physically separated from the world and everything that entails. He's forced into a new cold world of brick, concrete, and steel surrounded by the quiet violence of razor wire fencing and the very, exist the very existence of which highlights his dangerousness and proclaims that he deserves his captivity. His identity is socially stigmatized, but as a black man, he's conscious of the stigma of being a prisoner before ever becoming one. Once in prison, the prisoner must contend with the conceptions that they are intended to define him as other than who he is. Separated from equality and recognition, not once but twice, the black prisoner is held captive by the numerous conflicts and contradictions that play an integral role in his conception of himself. That's the end of the quote. We can understand the profundity of James's notion of double-double consciousness when we see that blackness and criminality and disability and animality are categories of capture marked by the ontological violence of carceral logics. Let me try to fill this out very briefly. Carceral spaces serve multiple purposes beyond containment and control. As James notes, they work at undoing and rewiring consciousness. The carceral spaces are not simply punitive, but serve, as Foucault noted, as socializing and disciplining institutions and as sites of surveillance. At the core of the various functions of carceral systems is a logic. In some instances, the logic is that of domination that supports and maintains not just disciplinary control of bodies, but taxonomies of power. In others, it's a logic that upholds ontological exclusion and the violence it authorizes. Sometimes these logics overlap, but they're distinguishable. In the first type of carceral logic, the logic of domination is the underlying justification for oppressive institutions, relationships and practices of domination and subordination. 
Domination occurs when a being is in a position where someone has the power to arbitrarily interfere with choices they would otherwise have been able to make. This is a, the, an idea that Philip Pettit notes, but it's been made in other places. And this notion of domination is rather expansive because the interference just needs to be possible in the form of a threat. It has wide reaching ramifications that one can internalize the potential to be the victim of domination when one experiences the threat and one can imagine one has the power to dominate if their threat is taken seriously and so act as if it is their privilege. So this sort of, dom this sort of carceral logic um, through a kind of domination naturalizes and normalizes the domination. Addressing this sort of carceral logic is important in many contexts, but there's a deeper concern. Often domination exists on the same plane as the structure of power. Dominated and dominator are at the same table as it were, or at least a table close by, and they have advocates at the table. Domination can be addressed from within the system, in other words, but there are some of there, there are some for whom domination is a condition of existence. The prisoner, even before incarcerated, as James put it, and the animal. The very system is structured on their domination, so can't be addressed from within. The carceral logic that they are subjected to that is prisoners and animals, goes beyond domination. Here's a logic that serves as a conceptual mechanism that fixes or solidifies and maintains exclusions and occlusions. It permanently marks another as other. The second sort of carceral logic is especially obvious in the cases of prison and other places of institutional captivity. And so I think is the human animal value dualism that maintains an anti-animal system and uses that anti-animality structure to limit who counts as human. While we may observe equal vulnerability and systems of abuse within the carceral spaces of prisoners and animals, the susceptibility to being incarcerated in the first place can remain invisible. This seems particularly germane when we consider the structural anti-Black racism that is a constituent part of the US prison system. The current prison system and its population highlights the process of criminalizing Black bodies that are thought to be purpose-bred for prison, as James notes. This is particularly violent carceral logic at work. Violent examples of carceral logic occur regularly in the animal realm. And there are so many examples, um, but I wanted to share just one that's particularly vivid, but don't worry, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to show, um, uh, I'm not gonna show, um, oh, that's what I did not want to do. Um, I'm not going to show um, gruesome pictures, um, but this is a slide of Marius, and some of you may remember Marius was a two-year-old giraffe who was shot in the head by the administration of the Copenhagen Zoo um, in February of 2014. Um, Marius was a giraffe in that zoo. He lived in that zoo. Um, so what happened next, and that's again, I'm not going to show what happened next was that the zoo performed a public autopsy of Marius's body and then fed um, Marius's body parts to the lions who were also held captive at the zoo. And the autopsy and the feeding were done in view of zoogoers, parents, and children. And then a bit more privately, that very same zoo killed the lions that ate Marius's body a month later to make room for more genetically worthy captives. The zoo's justification for killing Marius was that he had genes that were already well represented in the captive giraffe population in Europe. The justification for killing the lions was that the zoo was planning to introduce a younger male who was not genetically related to any of the females in the group. Sacrificing the lives of animals in the name of conserving an abstraction, in this case, a diverse gene pool, is rather commonplace in zoos. 
In the Copenhagen instance of zoothanasia, as it's called by the critics, the killing was grotesque with the shotgun to the head and the dismemberment public. But the practice of killing zoo animals more quietly is actually quite common, particularly in European zoos. This specimenification, making, speci making into specimens, I think helps create and continues to reinforce the afterlives of scientific racism, eugenic ideologies, and the continued exploitation of things deemed other. Zoo captives are disposable specimens par excellence, perhaps interesting ones, perhaps beautiful ones, perhaps entertaining ones, but disposable all the same. The example of the killing, dissecting, and feeding the body of Marius to the lions in front of the public shows this troubling acceptability of this violent carceral logic. Marius, like so many lifers, those who are incarcerated for life or people awaiting the death penalty, are disposable. Walking while Black, driving while Black, playing toys while Black, eating Skittles while Black, Black bodies are thought of as disposable. Being old and disabled and confined to an institution, a particularly an institution um, of a total institution, is another way that bodies and lives are disposed of. The public killing of Marius and the regular killing of so many animals inure the public to the ongoing disposal of beings who aren't just being discriminated against, aren't simply or merely being dominated or generally thought to be morally inconsiderable. It's reinforcing a value hierarchy where certain humans are on top and all animals are below. And some of the humans who are lower down are more disposable as well. They're what Cydia Hartman describes as fungible. Humans who fall outside of what is thought of as normal fall into the category of the fungible. People stolen from Africa in the transatlantic slave trade are prime examples. And there are estimated 27 million people in slavery today. Kevin Bales in his book, Disposable People, conservatively estimates that a larger number of people than the whole population of Canada are currently slaves. There's other examples, but for time, um, well, let me just mention one other example because it's one that I care a lot about. Also orangutans in Indonesia whose lives interfere with the production of ubiquitous palm oil are thought to be disposable and will probably be extinct in the wild within the next decade or so. Also the old people that um, Christine was talking about with ableism yesterday um, and people who are in quote unquote nursing homes that Shelley was talking about yesterday um, are often thought to be disposable. And we're clear, seeing that so clearly in the US during this pandemic. The dispo this disposability authorized by a type of carceral logic, the second type of carceral logic that I was talking about are at the root of an ongoing disavowal of the meaning of the lives of so many. Disavowal is a willful and culpable ignorance as James Baldwin described it. Michelle Moody Adams might call this affected ignorance, choosing not to know what one can and should know, which is always complex. And it's a disabling disavowal that may be too hard to really wrap our heads around because if we do, we can't really imagine how to go on. Social change work tends to be predicated on possibility if there's a structure that's thought to be problematically racist or sexist or ableist, for example, and that structure contains a commitment that would allow for the internal possibility of reform or repair, then when one can reasonably hope to change that structure, action makes sense. Social change work makes sense. But if the power of a system or structure is predicated upon the carceral logics that I've been discussing, that is, if a structure relies on the construction of the other as disposable and fungible, and that construction is central to its operation and pursuit, then work towards changing that structure is going to be self-defeating. To put it another perhaps pretty hopeless way, 
work towards changing systems that are built on carceral logics will reinforce the very power structures one is hoping to change. Sorry to end on that pessimistic note. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. I'm just going to start my video again. Oh, there we go. I think I'm in. Um, Lori, that was so wonderful. And I'm just now waiting for questions to come in from the Q&A. Um, we don't currently have any right now. Katie's asking if I have a question. And I was just thinking of so much. Uh, I've worked for the past, before I moved to Canada, uh, I was working for the past 10 years in a women's prison in rural Pennsylvania, medium, medium and maximum security prison. And I think for me, uh, and I mostly worked with lifers, uh, but these were women who had been sentenced usually like as teenagers to life without the possibility of parole. And what I found really shocking is that according to the prison's own, the prison's own statistic is that 99% of the women had been subject to sexual assault and battery by family members or their partners. So that's the prison's own statistic. And um, in my experience, and um, in my work with women, I was shocked by the disproportionate number of women. Really, I can't think of a single woman who hadn't been subject to um, being molested as a child and um, often by parents or family members. And uh, it's really an epidemic in the United States that nobody speaks about at all. And so for these women, the captivity really begins when you're a child. So that's just what I kept thinking about, right? It was like, it is such a prison and it is so overwhelming. It is so difficult to talk about. That it just sort of seems like a missing piece to me too, right? Like, especially if we're gonna, I know we're not being specific, but just the specificity of women's incarceration and how, and, and where that captivity starts. So I was just thinking about that. And then um, I have a book coming out in a week uh, all about hip hop. And uh, I've always been shocked that uh, philosophers who work in like philosophy, cross or logic or prison don't draw on hip hop lyrics. So I just wanted to uh, repeat what you said, <laughs> right? That like uh, so much of underground hip hop is testimony um, by black men, women who have been inside, but uh, who feel like their entire life, right, was like uh, sort of preparing them or um, trying to put them in the prison. And just the way that the lyrics uh, are conveyed and through the form uh, so that they can convey truths about the prison system outside of the dominant discourse that reinforces those logics that you were mentioning is just uh, incredibly helpful. And the only word that rappers use over and over and over and over again for that carceral logic is genocide. So when you were saying at the very beginning of your talk, like, I don't think we have the right language here. Um, I've been drawing on hip hop for five years against the uh, racist presuppositions of white genocide scholars in my field of genocide studies to push back and say, uh, if you're not understanding the conditions of confinement, right? And one, one thing that really frustrates me about uh, academics who work on prison is that they tend to uh, talk about the dis like disproportionate number of black men or the number of people in prison, right? And I love that your talk is really focusing on the conditions of confinement themselves. Like that is so critical. And if you take into account the conditions of confinement, you have to talk about a form of genocidal violence, right? Like uh, state-driven, state-sanctioned violence against entire communities as such that undermine the social vitality of entire communities. And if we talk about carceral logics outside of the political crime of genocide, I think it's always a disarticulation. But even though I'm saying this in sort of academic professional language, all of this is conveyed on the most profound level through the uh, content of underground hip hop. Uh, and through the form of the music itself. So I just think that's another critically important source for academics to be taken seriously. Um, Thanks Lisa. I, I think that's really, th those are both really, I think crucial and friendly um, ways of extending um, the thinking here. And, and what I'm, I'm actually trying to get at is that there is a sense in which the system as it exists um, 
as a genocidal system, as a system of um, creating and perpetrating um, disposability and fungibility is something that you can't really, it, it can't be reformed from the inside. That's essentially what I'm, I'm getting at. It has to be abolished. And um, that is part of what the, the idea is. It's, a, it's an argument in favor of that. I also just want to really uplift the thought that you had and the important idea that um, this process of being considered um, disposable begins especially for women, especially for, for women of color and black women in particular, really early. This isn't something that happens just when you get to prison. This is something that um, sort of happens at a very early place. And I, I didn't get to say enough um, in the talk today, but I've said in other places and will continue to say that I think that the, the structure of the human animal binary itself is a really rich source for thinking about how it is that so many people authorize this disposability of people who look like us, who look like humans, but are actually not considered part of the human sphere. And if we look at that binary and we understand its sort of normative construction, we can, we can get a better sense, not just at how disposable other animals are, but how disposable certain humans are as well. I totally agree. And I just feel like I could talk to you forever about very specific examples <laughs> that I heard from all my time in prison, really like, um, but I wanna look at the chat for a second. Um, one of the, uh, People uh, watching now, Elena Gauthier Marmoral, I'm so sorry I approached your name, just wanted to recommend the podcast Louder Than a Riot on the intersection between hip hop and the prison industrial complex. I will definitely check that out. Uh, I make a whole argument about that <laughs> in my book. Um, and then she has another question. It's for all panelists. What can we do to help abolish factory farms? Many people say they don't want to become vegan, even though they don't endorse factory farming practices. Since many people are resistant to giving it meat and dairy, what can we do? Wow. Well, um, that it, I I don't um, I don't really think I I mean I do think that there's a sense in which um, how people participate in these systems is important, even if individual action doesn't really sort of itself constitute social change. Um, and I do know that there's a sense in which um, people are um, reluctant to take this individual action, but collectively that um, individual action can do a whole lot. Um, however, I mean, I think one of the things that we need, one of the, th okay, let me just put it this way. One of the things that I have come to realize in the decades long work that I've done thinking about um, trying to uh, liberate animals, as it were, um, is that the st standard arguments about um, what we should be doing um, haven't really taken too much of a grip, given that more animals are being killed and eaten and used in industrial animal production um, than before those arguments were made. And that's not just based on the fact that there are more people. It, it, factory farming um, and intensive animal agriculture is expanded all across the globe. It's also expanded from land to the sea. Um, and so it's a, it's a massive um, industry. And I don't, you know, just as I would say, I don't really know um, other than um, sort of thinking harder, I'll, I'll use uh, Joe's line, I'm a, I'm a philosopher, um, I'm also an activist, but I think that, I, I, I think that um, encouraging people to recognize the, the disposable, the, the ideological nature of this disposability system and the way in which animals are transmogrified into food, the way they're thought to be food, um, is a really important intervention. I myself try to think that it's in, in ethics and animals, I argue that it's really important not to see other animals or other beings as edible in the first place. Um, and once we can make that conceptual shift, we might do a, um, a way uh, with some of the uh, demand at least for these uh, intensive animal agricultural practices. Thank you so much. Melinda Hall had a question and she thanks you for the fantastic talk. She says, I'd love to hear more about your work on disabled animals. It's clear to me that we 
systematically choose to create disabled animals in factory farming? Is there a sense in which the production of disabled animals is particularly convenient to capitalism? And meanwhile, what can we say about why the production of disability among incarcerated humans is convenient to power? Great questions, Melinda. Um, so on the first question about animals, Sunny Taylor does a terrific job of thinking about the way in which these institutions are disabling animals. Um, and it's as, as um, sort of obvious as uh, breeding birds so that they are so top heavy because that's the meat, the breast meat is what um, animal, that's what animal consumers like. Um, that that kind of uh, genetic manipulation and breeding um, makes it so the animals can't actually stand upright. They have to they they fall over because they're top heavy because they're bred to have more um, breast meat that can be consumed. Um, and there's also obviously a gender component here that Carol Adams has uh, spoken really powerfully about, as well as many others. Um, the and so it, it is actually and the it is actually quite tied um, to a very basic understanding of reducing these living feeling beings to commodities to be exchanged in a market. And, and if you think about fish, which most people don't think about often, but um, literally trillions of fish are caught or produced every year for consumption. Um, and and this is a, a this is in response to the capitalists, but the in when you try to figure out how many how many fish there are, it's very difficult because they're referred to in terms of tonnage. So this is, I think, a really interesting moment where a living being, you can't even extract the number of living beings that have been captured and killed for consumption because they're already commodified in tonnage. Um, and that's, I think, an instance of the ways in which um, it's quite convenient um, for capitalism. I did also want to say that that it's really important and part of the work that I'm doing on disabled animals is about animals with disabilities that they um, that they pose really complicated uh, challenges for thinking um, as I've been thinking about um, social the thinking of, of disability as an apparatus, um, a power or to think of it as a social condition because there are um, animals who, um, for example, um, I, who are neuroatypical and I know of others that have been actually um, disabled um, in other kinds of contexts. Um, and I, it's, it raises really tricky um, thinking, I think, for our way of thinking about disability more generally. Um, so I, I did want to just mention that. So it's not just the animals that are being produced or who are being disabled in the service of capitalism and consumption and commodification, but there's also this group of animals um, who are disabled and thus need to be in our care. And what that means, um, I think, raises real challenges for thinking about um, analysis of disability. I, so, I, I want to, I don't know if I could, I would like to show you Knuckles. I know this, this is, I'm, my, I know my talk was kind of depressing. Um, so I'm wondering if I could, I'm going to see if I can share this picture of Knuckles because this is, this is one of my friends who is, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Oh, darn. Uh, I should have put it. I'm not going to be able to do it. Sorry. Oh, well, um, I have this great picture on my on my desktop of knuckles but he's he has ms well thank you so much i'm gonna ask two questions together now since they both address the question of disposability um one is Maeve mccowan uh i was wondering if you could say more about why you think humans or animals are considered disposable once they are put in captivity it's very intuitive and seems true but why do you think that happens is it because captivity entails objectification or dehumanization or something else? And then the other question from Cecilia Mund. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Lori. I was mullying over the various thoughts I had during your presentation. I agree that cross-role logic is problematic, especially in terms of viewing the incarcerated as being disposable. One can think of disposable in various ways, 
And I'm wondering if the similarity between the logic of human and non-human animal incarceration comes apart when we consider the agency that is also involved in human incarceration. To let you know a bit more about where I'm coming from, I think your argument works really well when applied to members of marginalized groups, but perhaps not so easily with non-marginalized people. So for example, I may not think an unrepentant Nazi murderer is disposable, but I might think that incarceration is still appropriate and people might think that this is still a way of thinking that they are disposable. Okay, so those are those are huge questions. Um, and I think, um, so the second question, I, I was missing who asked that question, but about the um, incarcerating the Nazi murderer, this is a, this is a real question about abolition, um, the abolition of um, prisons, and that it that will take us um, in a sort of a pretty far direction in the other uh, that'll take us to another uh, set of issues. But I do want to say that um, what I'm suggesting is that reforming certain systems that are predicated on a car a sec the second kind of carceral logic that I was identifying. Um, a carceral logic that is not simply about um, domination of someone that is, as I was putting it, at the same table or at a table nearby. So part of your, your group that you're just recognizing is a little bit different. Um, and obviously a little bit different is a nice way of saying someone you can dominate given the historical and economic and social um, systems that are already in place. So I think that there's a problem um, uh, there. So I'm not making it seem like that's a nice kind of carceral logic. That first carceral logic might authorize a certain kind of punitive response to certain individuals who violate certain social norms. But the, the kind of disposability um, that the carceral logic that I'm thinking of that is underlying this the problem of disposability is uh, ontological as opposed to a social or uh, normative disposability. And so I think that the idea or, or do domination. So disposability, in the first instance, you get discrimination and domination. The carceral logic sees the other as lesser, less important, and the work to repair this inequality, as it were, is going to be work that brings those individuals, whether they're humans or animals, within the sort of magnanimous sphere of kind of equality or recognition or consideration. Um, that is, that's the kind of, um, that's a, an important analysis of domination and I don't want to diminish it, but I was, I was recognizing that there's something much more ontologically um, problematic and the notion of disposability is what is um, the carceral logic that creates disposable others, not others that are dominated or others that are disrespected or others that are treated badly, but others that actually you can dispose of. Um, that's the idea. And so if you have I mean, I guess that's, I don't know if that answers both of the questions, but if you have, quote unquote, the dangerous few, which is what this Nazi example just is, and in the abolitionist literature, we talk about them as the dangerous few. I mean, that's, those, those few aren't disposable. So I'm talking about a different, a different level of disposability. Uh, as a Holocaust scholar, I'm also always struck at the constant Nazi example and what that presupposes as well. I mean, that's just incredibly, incredibly problematic. Um, I, we do have time for one more question. Um, this is from Laura Couples. Hi, Lori, thanks for a great talk. I taught your interview with Misha Cherry on prisons on Monday, and some of my students at Kazanga felt like the idea of a carceral space was in danger of being too broad to be useful, given how many spaces can be somewhat controlling. Do you worry at all that the category of carceral spaces is overused? For instance, they objected to the term being applied to universities during the pandemic and to hospitals. Do you support a distinction between carceral spaces in a strong sense and a weaker sense? Excellent, excellent question. Um, there's a whole movement um, that has been developed um, over many years 
a number of really important abolitionist scholars have been um, active in thinking about abolishing the university, thinking of the university as a carceral space. I've always felt really uneasy about that. Um, I do think that it's really important to recognize um, that that's why I was saying my use of carceral logics is slightly different than the way that geographers, other abolitionists, and other scholars have been and activists have been using the notion of carceral spaces. But I actually think, and so I think of at least the notion of um, the carceral logic that I'm talking about as being a much stronger as opposed to weaker form of carcerality than the, the more uh, ubiquitous uh, notion of carceral space, um, where carceral space is really a space of control and confinement. Um, a, a space of, of captivity. Um, and I think there are degrees of captivity. And, and that's why I think it's so important to say specifically what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about captivity. Um, and I think of captivity as um, something that is much stronger than simply being, um, I, as I said, captivity is a a way of understanding captivity, my way of understanding captivity, you don't have to agree with me, but my way of understanding captivity is that it is a place in which you are um, not able to control, that you have no power, that there is, that the power is, is, um, is uh, sort of focused on you and you have no control. Um, these other spaces that get used and the students, um, I think are right to notice, um, there's, there is some power that you retain. So is, does that mean they shouldn't be called carceral spaces? Well, I actually think they, I don't wanna tell people what they should or shouldn't call them, but it seems like there's something useful about thinking of them as carceral spaces because then that leads to a conversation about whether or not there's control, whether or not a logic is operating, what kind of logic is operating. And if it's a carceral logic of the second sort that I was talking about that generates and emphasizes and maintains disposability, then that's really important. And it helps us see how other systems of carceral, um, maybe not as strong, the weaker version of carceral that um, was mentioned can support the stronger version. So I don't think it's a, it's a bad thing to make a distinction amongst these carceral spaces, but to continue to use the notion of carceral space, but just to be very clear about what it is that you mean when you're using that term. I also think it's very helpful too to think of the home as a carceral space for so many girls. I mean, this was has been my experience. I mean, when you are subject to ritually being molested and raped from a very young age, that is a carceral space, right? But we don't tend to think of the home in this way because of the way we romanticize it. But there's this like, uh, really insidious connection here between uh, girls who are molested and raped, like incest rape, right? In the United States, at least, this is like uh, what I know, and the women who wind up in prison, right? Anyway, that's just me, but I love that answer. You just have me going. We are technically out of time, but there are uh, two more questions that I would love to keep talking if you're okay, if you're up for a couple more questions. One is from Francisco M. Thank you for your talk. I'm wondering about instances where animal lives are publicly mourned, Harambe, and or more valued than black undocumented immigrants and disabled people. For instance, going vegan does not protect undocumented farm workers, including young children from being exploited. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I completely agree with that, that, that sentiment altogether. And I think that one of the things that the analysis that I'm um, proposing as well as um, the work that uh, Claire Jean Kim, who I mentioned, is doing, Syl and Af Co are doing, uh, a number of feminist and critical feminist animal studies scholars are doing, um, is precisely, and the work that I'm doing with Alice Crary in the book um, that Lisa mentioned um, called The Animal Crisis is doing exactly that. Um, and so there are obviously going to be, I mean, there is obviously a long history of thinking about um, animal, um, ethics, if you will, uh, that is very sort of strongly within a liberal humanist frame that I'm challenging. Um, I think some of the problems that Francisco um, is mentioning um, is precisely from that perspective. And it's a perspective that I also um, don't, I, I think needs to be challenged. Uh, one more question from Supriya Akerkar. While I see completely your point about incarceration about Black people or women, 
and racialization issues in the United States, how do you see incarceration of those who may be in dominant positions? For example, the police persons who killed George, George Floyd, should they not be in prison and in conditions of confinement? So again, this is, these are questions that one, um, one is sort of uh, always thinking about in the context of abolitionist practice. Um, and I think importantly, um, you know, I, I myself as a long time abolitionist, um, a, abolitionist that with that has sort of multiple uh, views about abolition in different contexts, but in the prison context, I actually find myself really wondering like, well, don't I think that Donald Trump should go to prison? Right, I, 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 but I don't, um, but I kind of do. So I understand the desire um, and the impulse, but the, the, the idea here um, is that um, the, the system itself is, um, that, that, that isn't the right um, punishment. It doesn't actually cause anybody to feel better. It perpetuates a system um, of, uh, it, the, the current uh, prison industrial complex um, is one in which pretty much nobody um, benefits from its existence other than um, certain people who are certain corporations that are money making money off of relatively cheap labor that is available in the prison context. Um, and so I think this impulse to want to incarcerate the quote unquote bad guys, whoever the quote unquote bad guys happen to be, is one that we've kind of internalized thinking that the system actually is going to provide us some relief. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't provide anybody any relief. Um, it doesn't provide victims relief. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be attending to the very real serious pain that victims and victims families experience, but the, the prison industrial complex doesn't do anything to address those issues. I would totally agree. And sometimes the way that I put it is the idea of prison or nothing as a consequence for breaking the law speaks to the poverty of our moral imagination that we just can't even conceive any realistic alternatives it is pathetic. But people who are abolitionists should not constantly be put in that position of what about a Nazi? Like, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> it's just like, that's not what we're talking about. So you, you answer that in a really generous way, but um, <laughs> it's a way of deferring the entire point, really. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, wow, I just learned a lot and that was so wonderful. Um, thank you everybody for coming by and please remember uh, that the conference continues tomorrow as well. Okay, so thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Laurie. A really excellent talk and wonderful session. A very lively way to end. Uh, and even, even though the content was pessimistic, somehow there seems to be an optimistic voice there as well somehow, you know, maybe, maybe just at the end where we're talking about other possibilities. So um, let me thank all the participants and uh, everyone who's asked their questions in this session and earlier today. Uh, that brings the session to an end for today. Of course, we come back tomorrow to thank you and we will close the session now, but uh, yeah, I hope to see you tomorrow.